he offers NT set LDT entries, which allow you um, to uh, specify your own segments. Of course, they do some filtering on the segments you create because otherwise you could do very nasty stuff like ring zero code execution with these segments. Um, but they allow you to, to have some control. And this, this uh, descriptor table is process specific, and for most processes, it's usually not present. And it's a very, very unknown and very little used feature, but software like Vine uses it. Um, some, some old patches that uh, before there was a non executable, but there was already for Linux non executable stacks that use the local descriptor table too, stuff like this. Um, so what I'm doing for, for, for the Sturbox thing is um, we have in, in Windows 32-bit Windows, we have two gigabytes of continuous um, user land memory. So for uh, executing our malware, we create a segment which is two, gigabyte, uh, two gigabytes big, and that's our new guest memory. And that's a very nice thing because uh, on Linux, by default, you have three gigabytes user space memory, so we can stay totally in, in the user space and have the Windows user space inside there too. Well, the thing is, though, that sometimes, depending on your process layout, on 32-bit kernels, you have only um, uh, three, these three gigabyte, and sometimes, depending on where your heap is located, if ASLR is on and so on, um, you cannot find two gigabytes of continuous address space. But on 64-bit kernels, um, you will, even for the 32-bit uh, processors, you will always have the full four gigabyte of um, address space, so it at least works there. Um, so instead of writing my own stuff for memory management, I'm abusing the existing hardware with some, some tricks to do the stuff for me. Um, that saves me time for development effort and also gives me speed increase. So um, we, the, the code itself, the rock code, is being executed on the host CPU with some limitations. Um, and we, we don't need to do instruction rewriting like QEMO does, for example, or VMware does in, in some cases if there's no hardware virtualization extensions because um, we are abusing the host MMU with segmentation to do the whole memory uh, access isolation for us. And since we don't need to do any instruction rewriting, we have a lot of performance boost because we can execute the code in place instead of copying and rewriting it. We don't need the time for reassembling the rewritten stuff, generating this code, and so on. Um, and yeah, so we're taking these basic blocks and, and executing them on a host CPU. So what do I mean by basic block? Well, basically basic blocks are the stuff, you know, the boxes uh, in the EDA graph view that are connected with arrows. So a basic block formally is, uh, is a sequential flow of instructions that are terminated by either control flow modifying instructions such as return, call, jump, conditional jumps, and so on, or privilege instructions like syscall, uh, sysenter, um, in out if you see them in user land for some weird reason and so on. Uh, and always I extra extract always one of these basic blocks, put them on the host CPU, execute them there in this isolated environment, and then continue at the next basic block, analyze it again and put it there. Um, one exception is there, there's backward pointing jumps. So if you have like a basic block which contains a conditional jump or unconditional jump, that points back into the same um, basic block. By definition, this would be like uh, where to the place where it points back. This would now split this basic block up into two basic blocks. But um, I ignore that because if we just jump back into this code and we don't create additional basic block, we again uh, have some performance improvements for, for loops and, and stuff like this. So if there is a, a backward pointing jump into the same block we're currently analyzing, we just directly copy the whole thing uh, instead of, um, yeah adding an additional um, basic blocks. So loops are very fast, at least small loops that are not very complicated. And currently, with the current uh, implementation, I don't implement any code caching because, well, I don't do instruction rewriting. So uh, the, the execution of a basic block doesn't require a lot of analysis code. Uh, and therefore, there isn't a huge uh, benefit from code caching. The only thing you could really cache is the length of the basic block you determined uh, just, but yeah, that's just an integer. And that, I mean, I should try it out maybe, but I don't, have, uh, I don't think I will have a lot of performance enhancement from that. So how are we handling self-modifying code? It's very trivial. Um, I mean, self-modifying code, of course, could mess around with us in case it would rewrite the same basic block we're currently executing because it could ins insert some control flow modifying instructions or whatever that would have terminated the basic block during analysis. The very simple solution is before executing actually the code, um, the, I pr I'm protecting um, the, the currently uh, executing page to be non-writable. So as soon as there's self-modifying code which tries to modify exactly inside the same page, 
uh, segmentation fault will be generated by the host operating system. I can catch that and from there on then start single stepping through the code and then therefore allowing self-modifying code. Uh, thing here is, um, though, that this is a very rare case because with most uh, self-modifying code like Packers or whatever, they're usually not writing or generating code inside the same, uh, same section a lot. I mean, they're, they're doing this a little bit for, for debugger evasion and analysis evasion and stuff like this, but the most of the unpacking stuff then happens into different sections, which is different pages, so there's not a lot. I mean, segmentation faults are expensive, but um, this doesn't happen very often. So that's again a very cheap, hacky way to, to avoid development time, but it works and it's very performant. So I'm going to show you a little bit demo of, of the slip CPU things. This is just some generic instruction stuff. So what I have here is um, a very, very simple um, test case code. It's just like a shell code, so there's no real binary format here, just a binary data. Um, this is a very simple code. It initializes the ECX register with a lot of iterations. It zeroes out the EAX register, and then in the loop itself, um, which you can see at the label called 1, it increments EAX, decurrent ECX, and as long as ECX is not zero, it jumps back to the loop start. So it's a very stupid loop that just counts up. The one register counts down the other one, and then we end with an interrupt 3. So um, you would expect in the you know, like emulation environment to take this a lot of time, but yeah, it's very fast. And why is that? Well, this is the debug output here. So as I've said before, uh, backward pointing jumps are are always um, not considered to terminate the currently executing basic block. So what you can see here is that everything, the whole, the whole code there is considered to be one basic block and the whole code is put directly on the host CPU and executed there in place. So um, the only second basic block is a terminating in three instruction. And as you can see from the register dumps here um, initially, after, um, well, at the end at least, um, EAX is the desired iteration counter, so we really incremented each time and I didn't cheat you. So if you, if you run some timing on this, this is quite fast. It takes, yeah, no time, <laughs> if you can believe this. Um, as a comparison, I took uh, LibEMU, which is, uh, LibEMU is a very nice library for shellcode detection. You can use it for client-side honeypots, server-side honeypots, that kind of stuff. But LibEMU is, which is, by the way, open source, is, um, is a full software emulator and that means it's kind of slow. I mean, this is now, of course, comparing, uh, in German we say, like, uh, uh, com comparing peas with apples because, yeah, it's not unfair to compare a virtualization with software emulation, but just so you get an idea, um, I'll first add some verbose output so you can really see it does all the incrementation and whatever. But printing stuff is, of course, slow, so I will leave that out, but executing it, you will see that it takes a lot of time and, okay, yeah, it doesn't take, oh, well, it did take some time, at least, comparably longer. And I've been benchmarking this with different, um, different uh, uh, iteration counts. Obviously, this is a um, linear difference, and it's about, t uh, depending on how much iterations you do, 1,000 uh, to 5,000 times slower. So um, LibEMU, I, I chose LibEMU because it's open source and you can verify the results, but basically all the antivirus emulators will suffer from the same, same uh, deficiencies. So if you have, like, some, some crypto puzzles or whatever in your packer, it's very easy to evade antivirus emulators. Um, the other demonstration of libcpu is a little bit more complicated, well, let's say shellcode or test case. Um, initially, we, we initialized the EBX register, which we use as a counter with three, and we reserved some space on the stack. And then we use uh, FNOP and FN store environment to uh, store the floating point environment. Uh, which also includes the address of the last uh, floating point um, instruction I executed. So this combination of these three instructions there basically just gets me the value of, of the address of, of this point here, of this label, into the ESI register, which where we will start copying from. Um, then I also uh, use the copy the, the source register to the target register, uh, add, of course, the length of this, this code block here, uh, of, of the uh, uh, code block from sled to end, and then I execute repeat move single byte. So basically, it's just like kind of a mem copy. So this code copies itself right after itself, and um, well, then it decrements EBX and then jumps back. Uh, well, if it reaches zero, it jumps to the end. Um, no, if it's not reached zero, it jumps to the end. And at this label end, of course, there will be the copy of the code we just generated. So this code is kind of a copy sled because it always copies itself after each other. Uh, and after three iterations, we will reach the three instruction finally. Um, 
Okay, well, as you can see, it worked. Well, how, um, this is self-modifying code, so let's crawl a little bit up. So initially here, what you see here is a move EBX3 and so on, the initialization, and then the get PC and so on. And um, at some point, we, so we put this whole basic block, including the rep move single byte and so on, on the host CPU. Um, what we will see then is guest signal 11, which is segmentation fault at address uh, 1E. Um, and 1E is uh, the, the address, no, sorry, this is the, the fault address, but EIP points to, to, uh, to, to 18, which is the repeat move single byte instruction. So that is because it's writing to the same code page as what I've been explaining before, self-modifying code. Um, it generates this, this fault. So the, um, we go into single step mode, execute only the rep move single byte without protecting the page as described before. And this allows us now to, to copy the code. And after this, we continue the basic block. In this case, it only contains the decrement EBX instruction. Then we're re reaching the jump of not zero instruction, which needs to be emulated in software because it's control flow mod modifying. And then we, if, you, if you look now at EIP, we're just copied our, our ourselves after each other. That is where some, some of the end was located before. We execute the same basic block again, and the disciples for three times. And um, yeah, after some time, we will reach the in three instruction. And if you look at the EIP value, this is way beyond um, the, the place where it initially was because we copied each other all the time. So this is how self-modifying code is supported. OK, so much so far. So one thing um, I said before, libemu is very nice for shellcode detection and everything, but it's very slow. Um, I created libsizzle, which is, well, you, I could have called it libx86 shellcode detection or whatever, but that's quite a long, and names like libshellcode, libsc are all already taken, so that's what I decided to name it. Um, so what does it do? Well, it's also for shellcode detection, and it's a very, very simple approach. We brute force over the byte buffer. So um, libemu, because it's slow, has very nice heuristics to find out where does, where there could be a possible shellcode start and so on. Um, but we don't need that because we, we have very high performance, so we can just put all the byte buffer. And um, we, we try uh, some offsets in this byte buffer, and if from a certain offset executing from there, we can um, execute n valid instructions. We assume we found a valid shellcode, because for non-shellcode, which is not really code, you will not be able to uh, execute a lot of uh, instructions because you will run into segmentations, faults, uh, something like this. And, uh, in reality, I had to, to add some more nice heuristic, like uh, count of basic blocks executed, number of interrupts executed, and stuff like this. But it's not really very fancy, so in essence, you just brute force over it, try to execute it from every single byte offset. And to improve performance, um, I, I pre-filtered buffers, so I'm scanning for so-called get PC sequences. These are like little gadgets, like what I've showed before with the floating point unit that um, get the, the, the uh, address of the code, the, the value of the uh, program counter into some register. And uh, we have uh, four different candidates for, for these gadgets on the 32-bit uh, x86 architecture that I'm scanning for. Um, first two are opcodes A9 and A3. They are for, uh, for moves that either move um, from a register to a memory location or from EAX, which is just a different opcode to a memory location. And these are used for SEH, Structures Exception Handler, um, uh, get PC gadgets on, on the Windows architecture. Um, then there, uh, which is very generic instructions, um, but there's a certain prefix to them, which is for the FS segment. That's just some details, but um, you can filter out more of it. This and then also there is the uh, FSTNF instruction, which is used for the previous gadget I've shown you. And then of course you can uh, use the call pop uh, primitive for getting the instruction corner. And filtering for that already. Uh, discards a lot of real word buffers because they're all non ASCII opcodes, so you can filter out a lot of uh, uh, stuff already. Uh, and, and then again, it's very fast if you would do some additional parsing. So, um, for these operands, for these instructions, like the move instructions or the store floating point environment instruction, I actually also kind of uh, parse or disassemble the operand and do try to find out is it actually a valid operand. Uh, uh, and if not, I can also discard this, this position in the barbs file. So um, for the floating point instruction, we also, I also require the operand to be relative to the ESP register because that's what you usually see. I mean, obviously, there's ways to circumvent this, 
but this will catch all the real virtual shellcodes. Um, and that's what I'm actually releasing for free.